You're listening to Backbench Drivers. I'm your host, John Lawson. And joining me this week, again, we have two returning guests. Both of them are experts in their field. First of all, we've got Harry Richardson here, who is the current president of the British Australian community. And he's getting over a cold, as some of you might be able to see right now. And we also are joined by Virtual Wilson, who is a former chief economist at the ACCI, I believe. And he is also involved a lot in election strategy. He's been involved with the Libertarians. I'm, I'll let him go into a little bit of depth about his involvement there. And the topic for this week, what I really wanted to dive into, was the recent BAC or British Australian Community uh, Political Action Conference. And I wanted to especially compare that to the Conservative Political Action Conference, which took place at the same time up in Queensland. <laughs> Uh, hopefully Harry survives the episode, yeah. but uh, I'll leave it to you guys. Harry, do you want to first introduce yourself a little bit and then uh, we'll go on to virtual. Okay, so I'm Harry Richardson. Um, thank you very much for bringing us on, John. Really appreciate it. Um, I first sort of got into this, sort of started into this sort of space in, in 2006. I started writing a book on Islam called uh, The Story of Muhammad, Islam Unveiled, which <clears throat> took me a good six years. Um, then I began writing for what was then the Pickering Post, which was Larry, Pick Larry Pickering, the um, other famous uh, political cartoonist. And uh, eventually I took that over when he sadly passed away in 2019, I believe. And since I've been really heading more into the identitarian space, I'm finally writing a, a book with Frank Salter, Dr. Frank Salter, um, called Anglophobia, the Unrecognized Hatred, which uh, details um, much of the anti-white hatred which is going on today. So uh, I'm giving really a justification for um, a degree of identitarianism amongst white people. So, yeah, and, and then I came on the uh, the uh, National Observers podcast, so, <laughs> a new pinnacle of my the career. The pinnacle of your career. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. There you go, great minds think alike. But uh, no, thank you for joining us, Harry. And, uh, yeah, no, it's good to have you. Everyone should check out your previous episodes. Mm -hmm. And, Virtual, uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, look, I've got an economics and law background, uh, ex-treasury, ex-financial markets, ex-energy sector, former chief economist at the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, post-grad from Johns Hopkins University, and uh, notoriously was doxxed by the Clean Energy Council about 10 years ago after heading up a, a uh, energy policy campaign that just pointed out none of their business uh, made any sense. It was commercially unviable without subsidy, and they didn't like that very much. So, um, uh, con consequence of all that, it's been cast out of polite society. I know these people pretty well. I've been looking at uh, public policy for about, what do you reckon, 30-odd years, and a lot of that professionally. So... I know these people, I know why we're having the difficulties we're having, and I know how bad our conservative establishment are, having been treated uh, quite poorly by them myself. So, not worthy of anyone's time, not worthy of anyone's loyalty, and the more we see people exiting out of the coalition to uh, alternative right-wing parties, and look, I didn't mean to say alternative right, but dissident right-wing parties, um, the better, because uh, the, the people's trust in those mainstream institutions are uh, justified. It's being withdrawn. It just be, needs to be put somewhere uh, far more sensible. Yep, spot on. And um, you were recently in attendance at CPAC Queensland. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Maybe start off with what was the theme, who were some of the big speakers and um, what your general thoughts are on it. Do you think that CPAC is pushing in the right direction or is it a little bit misled? So I think the important thing to realise about CPAC from the start is it's sponsored by Advanced Australia and the Institute of Public Affairs. So essentially it's it's kind of a, it's more a Liberal Party conference than it is a Conservative Political Action Committee in, 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 this, in the same sort of way that uh, CPAC in the US is a broad, broad tent. So this is basically... The Liberal Party's conservative base and the National Party uh, providing a forum for their speakers to give their view of the world and uh, very little outside of that is actually tolerated. 
especially on the um, the, the public forum. Uh, there is benefit in networking. So the key reason I went was you have maybe a thousand odd people who are members members of Australia's political class at one point in time at one location and. I think I spent about 20 minutes all up listening to presentations because I just found it, uh, it was, they were boring. For the most part, it was, it was performative nonsense that I've seen before. They don't take any of this stuff seriously. They don't follow through on any of it. So most of my time at the event, I spent um, chatting with uh, the likes of Harry, uh, the BAC, and a whole bunch of interesting people that turned up to the event. And look, one or two of the speakers were kind of okay. But... Yeah, and that's something that I personally think is worthwhile. Oops, sorry. Yeah, you cut out for a second there, but we'll continue on. Yeah, but for the most part, it was just uh, it was it was it was tedious. It was it was boring. It's essentially just uh, Sky News uh, conservative conservative porn. I mean, it was ultimately um, productive of nothing. So uh, other people have, have said this as well. It was probably the worst uh, CPAC so far. And I got that from someone else who's been to about three or four of these things. So I think it was a particularly bad year. Um, I suppose the reason for that was they would have tightened up uh, some of the the speakers. So One Nation, for instance, weren't, re weren't represented at all. Uh, Cato Australia's party, given that we've got a Queensland election coming up, we're allowed to, on the forum. And I think that's um, it's a function of the gatekeeping done by the people who are sponsoring this thing, the uh, the IPA and the Mass Australia, which is basically they're both they're both Liberal Party they're both little Liberal Party um, instruments. I mean, they're not in any sense uh, uh, think tanks or genuine grassroots movements. They're just um, part of the political establishment. This is a forum designed for that political establishment. A certain uh, certain bump of it. And anything further right or outside of that um, uh, political worldview is simply not um, not really tolerated. Well, that's that's my view. Yeah, and I think that's reflective in the kind of uh, media that we see coming out of the kind of speakers that they host. It's really nothing that's groundbreaking. I mean, what is, what is conservative conservatism in Australia even conserving these days if you can't speak on the topics? of immigration which is probably the single biggest factor changing our way of life um and i mean if, if we're talking about the definition of conservatism we're talking about an ideology which seeks to conserve those traditions and those elements of our life which have been passed down from generation to generation and make our country what it is so if conservatism in australia isn't conserving that it really is a defunct ideology it's a defunct movement and I think that's reflected in how little enthusiasm there is surrounding it. Like you said, a lot of opportunists are there, a lot of people there for networking um, at CPAC, that is, and um, very few that are there because they're really <laughs> going to go get hyped up by the speakers. But um, did you have anything to add, Virgil? Yeah, I was just thinking, you've, you've prompted me to think, the best way to describe CPAC is as a cheap pop off grift for party insiders and the hangers on. So, yeah, people selling books that um, weren't going to be particularly impact impactful. I don't know why, but I bought a copy of one of Campbell Newman's books. Uh, Connor, Connor Court actually is pretty good, but um, a lot of these people, it's just a job for them. They don't actually believe anything. So, a lot of the uh, presentations I saw, uh, they were given without any real conviction. I mean, there's, there's just people speaking from notes with their eyes down, and you could tell they just they they they, they didn't really believe anything. It's just a job for them. So they're just cheap transactional people who don't actually care about the the outcomes they deliver. They just wanna they just wanna stay on the gravy train, stay employed. And if I were them, I'd be I'd be terrified as well because these people have no discernible. Um, skill sets, if they lost whatever crappy jobs they have at Advanced Australia or at a minister's office, um, they're basically roadkill. So they they hold on as tight as they can. They're extremely uh, risk averse. They're quite willing to just tow the party line, thinking outside of those Sky News talking points. That doesn't even occur to them. Or if it does, it's um, 
to the extent that they just don't openly disavow all that stuff. So that it's not an intelligent conservative forum having intelligent conversations. It's just uh, talking points we've heard over and over again, stale, boring, and irrelevant for the most part. Yeah, sure looks like it. And I'll bring Harry in here on this. Harry, I don't know if you were in attendance at CPAC, but maybe yeah, you could tell actually, us a little yeah. bit. Oh, you were. So you can yeah. uh, give us your thoughts on it. Is this the impression you got or is CPAC the life of the party? Is that where everyone's going well, uh, to get uh, their ideas? <laughs> um, I, was, I didn't go to get ideas, but I'd never been before. So to be fair, so it was, um, it was interesting. I mean, it's nice to see lots of money put on. <clears throat> um, it's very ritzy event, you know, lots of uh, from dressed up and you know, famous famous ish sort of people you know uh on the on the right the very right fringe of the liberal party which um <laughs> uh, for whatever you want to take that as um and uh, yeah i think i i i don't think i'm as jaded as virtual but probably because i'm not as familiar with, with the, that world um but i i suspect i suspect that he would probably be right in most of most of his assessment um, that, that seems to be my assessment, again, f coming from as an outsider and, and looking in. Um, uh, so um, it was enjoyable to, to meet people. I mean, I, I met Birchall there, which was the first time, and uh, you know, um, passed a couple of books out and you know, uh, met some, some people who I think are, you know, will be... It's always good to network with people who have got um, uh, similar sort of ideas. Um, I, I think... I think that conservatism and being conservative, most people in our organization would conf, con, uh, uh, agree with, concur with um, conservatives on, on you know, 70 or 80 percent of issues that we don't have. We do have s at least one member who's fairly left wing, um, but we're, we're not a, a left right sort of body. We're a, a, an ethnic um, uh, promotion body, a, a, an ethnic defense agency. So that's it's not up to us to tell tell our members whether they should be right or left um but um the conservatives i agree with virtual they, they've they've been uh they've been driving through the swamp in a, a gilded limousine or or um a, a, a 10 million dollar yacht and enjoying the the view from up there sort of things and um they haven't look there's lots of people i think in the conservative movement that have wanted to do things and those that stepped up like virtual have been kicked out basically um so what's left are the people who are savvy in looking after their own reputations and their own um i, I don't want to sound too cynical but their own little gravy train sort of thing they're, they're protecting their own turf this is what and this is what um uh electoral politics is about and that's why I haven't ever really got into playing it. It's not my my thing. I, I, I'm not good at it. I, I, would, I don't think I'd ever be good at it. Uh, it doesn't particularly interest me. Um, so we're, I, I view politicians like weather like weather vanes. So whichever way the wind's blowing, they will. They will a good politician. Oh, oh, things have changed. People are going this way. Okay, I'll go this way. Um, so our job, I believe, is to change the wind rather than change the you know, put, rather than putting a different weather vane in. Yeah. Because if you get the wrong weather vane that points the wrong way, the wind will just blow it over. So we need to um, be um, affecting the, the way that the wind blows. And I think that a lot of these savvy politicians, politics will always, always be full of savvy politicians, and they're they're sniffing the wind and seeing which way it goes. And is there enough of a, a wind blowing in this particular direction that I can take a position going that way? So our job i feel is to to provide that well in that metaphor the wind or the, the strength of the wind would be the number of people that hold well the, the number of people that hold the popular opinion or the, the the number of the elites that hold that same opinion and at the moment that is basically across the board liberalism um yeah. I, I think that fairly simply sums it up i mean that uh, any anything is okay. Anyone can be an Australian. Any values are okay as long as you don't harm another. Is sort of the consensus morality at the moment, and I suppose the BAC does stand in contravention of that. In that it says no, Australia is a specific people in a specific place, and it does deserve uh, defending even against the interests of others who would wish to tear it down. 
So I suppose with uh, in contradiction to CPAC and like you said, uh, the, the careerist grifters that are there to basically signal that they're in alignment with the consensus morality, we have BAC PAC or the British Australian uh, Communities Conference. Uh, and uh, Harry, you're one of the headline speakers there. Could you tell us a little bit about what the idea behind Backpack is and uh, whether you think it was a success in achieving what it set out to do? Well, it was um, suggested to us that we we put on an event just before CPAC because um, it was in Brisbane this year. So there was quite a few, you know, it's in Sydney, but there was quite a few people when you would be flying up from Sydney, um, probably on the Friday. We thought Friday afternoon would be a good time if we put it on close to the event, um, just walking distance and, um, you know, an interesting event and, and market it to the people that were coming up to CPAC that um, we get uh, hopefully a, a few of them coming across. Um, which I think we did get, get one or two, but not too many. Um, that was the original rationale. Um, but we, we so we, we really we were you know, coasting on the coattails of, of CPAC and uh, and the, the just the name sold it BAC PAC. <laughs> so um, I thought, yeah, that's great. Yeah. So we, we put that on as a as a thing, and that was that was the rationale for it. And it was just we haven't really put on our own um, com- conference kind of thing before, so. And uh, we, 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 I'm very fortunate the BAC has a, an amazing team. We have this really awesome team of, of young guys um, and, and old, you know, younger and older. So there's, there's a spread through the range of really capable people. And they all just jumped in and <laughs> within three weeks, we organized and put on this conference, which just amazed me. So, um, yeah, I, I was... I was, actually I'm, I'm working like three jobs as well as doing this stuff. So I was like the, the, the day of, C, of BAC pack, I was still writing my, um, my speech and one of our younger guys was helping me and he was freaking out about it. But I just, um, I just put down more or less dot points. And I, I knew roughly about what one I wanted to talk about. And so I was able to talk, um, for a while on that. And, and as Birchall said, luckily, I, normally I, I'm not very good at that. And um, I tend to do what Birchall was saying, which is have my notes, because I'm, I'm not able to remember a lot of this stuff and keep on, on track. So, um, but this time I sort of knew what I was going to say. So I just had some dot points and I was able to speak. And it came out reasonably well. I, I'm a much, I believe I'm a much better writer than a speaker. I'm not, I'm not overly um, keen on my own speaking abilities, but yeah. Um, the others seemed to think it was okay. So um, well, actually they thought it was pretty good and the audience seemed to think it was pretty good. And then we had Frank who had a, a prepared speech and Frank's always worth listening to because he's, he's a, very, a very deep thinker. He's very good. Um, so it, it, yeah, it, was, it turned out a really nice event. It was, um, it was on at um, a place which is the United Services Club in Brisbane, which is like an, an, a, a, a historic military club, which was really nice, was like all oak panelling and walnut and everything. So... It was just the perfect setting for us, really, because it was it just had that traditional, you know, historic feel to it. So yeah, so it, it all worked out really well. I think the people there really enjoyed it. And again, it was it was I think everyone as much as the speeches, it's nice to network with people. And in the conservative world, it's generally easier to network with people. But in the in the identitarian sort of world, people are terrified. <laughs> you know, they're um, you know, it were, were the sort of verboten. Um, cabal who, who were you know one step for me it's not too bad I'm in a fairly good position but for most many people who are younger and have careers and things you know as, as Birchall found out they can terminate your career and you and you find yourself um, if you're not really talented um, and able to, to to set up on your own or whatever or, or go against the, the entire consensus then it can be pretty scary so um, it's nice to come to a place where you're amongst your own people who can just and talk about things that you know normally we're, we're tapping away anonymously on keyboards and you can actually talk to people who you know in the flesh agree with you and don't think you're an actual, an actual lunatic or a threat to democracy <laughs> so yeah it went well so we went in another direction a whole bunch of us uh, did a mag of drinks on friday uh, with uh, libertarians national conservatives a few high profile people in Queensland and nationally, and uh, sl- slightly more informal, uh, just uh, I think about two dozen of us, rooftop bar, private dinner afterwards, and um, yeah, that, like like Harry um, mentions, just great to network with people. So I think the thing I find is conservatives don't, just don't do that terribly well. 
and we don't didn't have well i think everyone's at risk of cancellation even if you're an identitarian or you're not and i'm not sure i'd put myself in that category uh at this point but um look i i was i was doxxed over um a sort of really trivial tongue-in-cheek remark has completely derailed my policy career that's how that's how weak the chamber of commerce is that's how uh that's how mendacious and evil australia's journalists are they are actively trying to get uh, people fired they're actively trying to destroy people's careers businesses and they have the imprimatur of um, our media overlords to do that. So where does where does this neoliberal, this highly intolerant neoliberal orthodoxy come from? Well, on the conservative side, it's basically Sky News, the Australian newspaper, and uh, the Murdoch Press. So that's uh, that's the tune all these guys were singing at CPAC. And to the extent they weren't, it was a function of the fact they were slightly more independent of, of those. Um, platforms for media exposure and therefore uh, didn't necessarily have to to tow that line and and, and you saw that with um, speakers like Helen Dale for instance who was fantastic uh, Jack McGuire at Red Union and uh, Ian Plymer to some extent so these, these people they don't need this Sky News media to get on television or get published in the Australian so that they have their own views they have their own audiences they have they have their own um uh financial support which is crucial and if you don't if you if you don't have the capacity to be self-employed you're pretty much political roadkill in this country if you're forced into that uh center left center right orthodoxy unless you're a green and sort of the right wing of the spectrum just it's not terribly well organized at this point and to the extent that people do occupy positions um it's not not clear to me that they're doing much with it so one nation for instance is kind of seem to seem to have capped out at about eight percent of the vote and unable to do um, unable to perform beyond that and don't seem to be doing much in terms of building an actual grassroots conservative movement or political party so it just degenerates into a cheap uh, fuck off grift in which these people milk the taxpayer for their, their salaries in office as staffers. And it's just sad. It's just sad because they don't bother to do the hard yards of fundraising and they can't because they, they're never accountable to people. So if you want to raise money from someone, you have, you have to be accountable for how, what you do with that money. And for the most part, uh, these minor parties, they don't have a good track record of um, performing well when they do receive donor funds. So natural result is that they they burn their donors that they do have, and there's no sustainable movement. So it um it it's all really sad. It's all really uh, uh, fixable. It's just trying to find the high quality people who are willing to commit curious suicide to save the future of their country uh that's kind of dealing with um i don't know between zero and one people at this point anyway it's um uh, that's just where we are and can't, the overlay of cancel culture on everything is just in intolerable they the the, the, the neoliberal establishment in this country and globally they are just wildly intolerant they will fire you over trivia and that's just uh that's just the way they operate so they don't they don't line you up against the wall and shoot you they just send you to an open air economic gulag that just happens to encompass the entire western world and that's uh they think that's fine so um free speech and helen dale helen dale was the standout for me virtual you're certainly uh the You're certainly the residential uh, black pill dispenser, that's for sure. I mean, <laughs> uh, I feel like Harry and I might have a bit of a brighter outlook, but what you're saying is, is true. I do see that there are, there are very heavy consequences for speaking about our ideas. Pardon? Well, my view is just you have to diagnose a problem before you can come up with solutions for it. So if, if anyone's serious about engaging in politics and they're young, what do they need to do? 
they, they need to get themselves on track to being self-employed, uh, being independently wealthy, and um, without without their own sources of um, finance or economic independence, they're uh, they're just going to be trashed. They're just going to they'll lose their entire careers. They'll lose their uh, businesses potentially, and that's just the way the Murdoch press operate. Yep, spot on. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the ideas that are different between CPAC and Backpack. And uh, I think we can begin by comparing their position on, I suppose, the right to self-determination of white people. Now, uh, I'll get you guys to both speak on this, but for example, we, we look at the conservative ideology that is prominent in this country, and it's very much taken that centre-right slant that is popular across the rest of the Western world in their mainstream conservatives. It's something that you hear Jordan Peterson talk about, people like Ben Shapiro, etc., cetera, um, who are very intolerant towards further right ideas. So they, these kinds of guys will talk about how identity politics itself is very poisonous. It's uh, This is what is destroying the West, and they blame identity politics on the left. They'll say that the leftists talking about religion, gender, uh, race, LGBT stuff, that, that is making people focus on the ide ideology when in reality we should be focusing on the content of their character. So they've sort of derived this Martin Luther King conservatism, <laughs> if, that can be, uh, if that can be said without laughing. But um, meanwhile, we'll, I, I know that I think maybe at least Harry and I and, and maybe Virtual as well take a contrary view, which is that Identity politics is natural. It's a natural exp expression of uh, different people's cultures and, and wish to preserve them. Um, and so, therefore, uh, white people should be allowed to also pursue identity politics in the same way that various elements of the left and various other minority ethnic groups do. Harry, I'll get you to talk a little bit on this. Is this the core difference you see between conservatism and identitarianism? or uh, between your two conferences, or am I missing something? I think that's a fairly reasonable assessment. I mean, people are motivated by lots of things, whether, you know, sometimes they'd be motivated by uh, glo you know, global warming or a reaction to it in one way or uh, one side or another, or they might be motivated by low taxes, um, small government, things like that, or big government, more welfare, whichever it might be. But the most people at their core Maybe not all the time, but when things when things become harsh and when things start to go bad, motivation tends to suddenly devolve into um, uh, identity. Um, humans are, are not like cats; we're more like dogs. We're, we're tri we we're, we're, we're evolved as a tribal group, and we survived in tribes. So it, you know, when people were thrown out of the tribe, it was usually like almost a death sentence. Um, so we're, we're evolved to be tribal creatures. And it, this is, most people really um, understand that. Uh, the tribal thing, uh, I think thanks to technology and various cultural uh, things, evolved into nation states so that the tribe, whereas England would have been um, a whole group of different tribes, eventually they came together and, and uh, created a, a national sort of tribal identity. So people have different identities. You know, they can be football supporters, you know, for instance. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, they might have, they might be uh, conservatives. They might be you know. They're, so they have various identities. Um, if you look at what happened in a place like Yugoslavia, where people live side by side, all of a sudden, when the when the thing started to dissolve, all those other identities were put to one side, and people were shooting at each other big over identity. You know what what um, ethnic group you depended you, you belonged to, and that is generally the, the story of human human history um when we were when i was young we had this thing with the you know communism and and people were concerned that we were, we were you know communism was going to going to take over but people did, didn't say hey you know the communists are going to come they said hey the russians are going to come it was it was an ethnic thing you know we were, we were frightened of the russians not so much of the cambodians say for instance so it wasn't the ideology so much as the the ethnic group um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> I want to start talking, it's coming up. 
So yes, um, uh, basically the um, uh, I, I, most of us would agree that um, on our you know in most people in the BAC agree they feel reluctant to back climate change. They would agree with small government, less regulations, more business, less welfare, and all of those kind of things. But that's what you're allowed to say. So I think it's always important to look at what you're not allowed to say. What are you, you know, I won't say allowed. I mean, you will be attacked for it. But what is the one thing that is absolutely forbidden? And we identified this early on as like, you can't say, actually, I'm white and I feel quite, pr quite proud of my people. I feel proud of my group. I, I, I identify with them. I think that we should have our own homeland and be able, allowed to remain a majority. That was the absolute off the scale, you know, literally Hitler thing, you know. So, and I think that was, we saw that with Donald Trump. When Donald Trump came down the, the excavator, excavator, elevator in Trump Tower, it wasn't that he was wanted to cut re, uh, regulations or that he wanted to, you know, reduce foreign wars and things. What, what really triggered the left was that he said, I'm going to build a wall and keep out, um, illegal migrants from Mexico. I mean, he didn't even say he was going to cut immigration. He just wanted to take out the illegals, just the the the, the worst of the worst. And that was really what um, separated him from people like George Bush or Ronald Reagan, who who hadn't really um, done that. And it was, I mean, Donald Trump was only putting a toe into the water, and he a lot of people felt he could have followed through with that a lot more. The wall never fully got built. He, I think he made a, a reasonable effort, but not anything like enough. And, um, but, but for that, he was absolutely crucified. Number one, when Joe Biden got back in through whichever means you want to believe, number one, first day, what did he do first day in the office? Stop building the wall. Right now, we'll stop building that wall. I mean, and that tells you something about what is the priority of the left? He, he wasn't talking, he wasn't saying, no, we've got to bring back regulations or, or this or that. It was the wall had to be, had to be torn down, you know, or, or stopped. And they actually cut sections out. I saw them cutting sections out and, and waving people through. It was, this, this is to them is their big thing is to make sure that this immigration flow does not stop. And I've seen um, footage of Joe Biden sitting there talking, saying, um, in this country, um, white people like me were becoming a minority because of this endless flow of migrants and it won't stop and it shouldn't stop. It's a good thing. It's our greatest strength. And I think it's really great. And these people love people like Joe Biden. It's like, yeah, come on in. You can get a great job. We'll pay you lots of money. We'll turn a blind eye to all your corruption. You can be selling us out to the Chinese. Happy days. But if you, if you come in like um, Donald Trump and say, well, we'll, 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 we'll at least cut the, the worst of the worst out. That is unacceptable. And that tells you where the um, priorities of the, the people who are really running the show, like the ones that you don't see on television, that tells you where their priorities are. And it's not good for us. Yeah, really well said. And I wanted to just go back to a point that you made earlier about Yugoslavia and people reverting to their ethnic identities in times of strife and people grouping together and uh, finding strength within those identities. And I wanted to just note that oftentimes the opponents of identity politics and oftentimes more specifically white identity politics, uh, what they often say is that, uh, well, they'll, they'll associate the grim consequences of a, a collapsing society and the people's natural reversion to their ethnic groups as their core identity. And they'll, they'll collate those two together and say, well, therefore, people reverting to their group identities, their, their ethnic identities, will lead to a collapse in society, will lead to violence. And I don't believe that's true. I think that the fact that people are reverting to those ethnic communities to find strength in those times of strife actually reveals what is undergirding the entire society, which is um, really the ethnic uh, family. The fact that at the end of the day, you, people feel as though they can fall back on and they can trust those who are like them, those who have descended from the same people as them, who share the same land, the same history, the same uh, folk stories and music and, and things like that. And they actually find strength in that. And as a counterpoint to uh, ethnic identity becoming relevant in a time of collapse and strife, I'd like to point to Australia's rise, which was actually built upon, uh, you know, this, this ethnic cohesion, uh, specifically around British and Irish, or perhaps more specifically British, um, uh, immigration policy and wish to keep 
Australia as a white country, and this is often referred to as the white Australia policy, which was the one of the core reasons why federation came about in 1901 was so that Australia could have a united immigration policy which kept our country's demographics white, predominantly white, overwhelmingly. And this was successful for a long time. And in fact, this uh, ad adherence to our white identity actually came at a time where Australia rose from a tiny outpost, a, a prison colony on the edge of the world, to one of the most powerful, uh, uh, strong and, uh, and really comfortable peaceful countries in the world, one of the economically strongest. We don't have uh, violent regime change. We have, uh, we've actually built up one of the most caring uh, governments of all time. Whatever you think of that, we, we do really care for our population, although that's going away a little bit. I mean, we look at the welfare state, we look at uh, Medicare, all these things which could really not have come about if you had the kind of uh, ethnic strife that we see in South Africa and increasingly in countries like America and Britain. And, and the rest of Europe and, and in Australia as well, eventually. So um, I think that rather than looking at identity politics as a result of a fracturing, breaking down society, we should instead look at it as the bedrock upon which everything else can be built. And when everything above that bedrock is knocked down, when all, all of the superstructure, so to speak, it collapses and falls down, people do revert back to that undergirding rock that everything was built upon. But we shouldn't mistake that for it being only re relevant in times where uh, society is falling apart. But I I've talked for a little bit now. Virtual, I'll bring you in. What's your, um, what's your opinions on all of this? And uh, do you see a prospect of Australia's conservative movement embracing some of the roots uh, that made the country strong in the first place? Uh, so, uh, I acknowledge the, uh, the arguments there. So, uh, I don't think I've ever come across anyone who's ever left their inheritance to strangers, for instance. But so I think it's a, it's a question of values and a lot of civic nationalism and national the national conservative worldview is uh, based around uh, societies having a, a set of values that are coherent and that are actually um, uh, made part of the, part of the education system, part of the civic culture that are that are propped up by uh, government action when necessary. And I just, I'm also fundamentally quite a pragmatic individual. So I think I know about history is living in a multi-ethnic state is incredibly dangerous. And Anglo-Saxon societies have been uh, uh, quarantined from that to a large extent. And that's helped underpin their political uh, stability, which ultimately uh, has enabled their economic uh, development, rapid economic development, and look, we we still, through America, lead the lead the globe. But um, what we see in America is the country's is coming apart. I mean, there's two different Americas now. There's the uh, legacy America of the Anglo and European settlers, and then there's this kind of third world America that's being bolted onto it that has all sorts of dysfunction. That seems pathologically uh, antithetical to the establishment legacy America. And you just wonder, well, how, how is that sustainable? How, how is that going to remain one country? And, uh, I mean, we're, we're seeing how these things play out in our near abroad in Yugoslavia, where European people were killing other European people simply because they um, had wildly different, uh, wildly different values and, and worldviews. And uh, to bring that on a nation state, uh, voluntarily is just a, it's a wicked it's a wicked sin that's probably the core evil of the globalists these are the people who excoriated Enoch Powell uh, back in the day it turns out Enoch Enoch Powell he was right about everything it turns out Samuel Huntington oh he was right about everything as well and his prescribed reading in most political science courses but uh, talk to any progressive um, uh, leftists. And Samuel Huntington is basically an octogenarian racist. And, and he's the only uh, individual who has published in the political science arena that's um, produced a model of um, global politics founded in culture that's actually got predictive power and has um, performed extremely well. I mean, he, he predicted U Ukraine, he predicted America coming apart. 
He predicted the arc of instability surrounding the Muslim world. So uh, anyone who isn't on this sort of wavelength, to my mind, they're just they're just sort of they're they're at war with the world. They're at war with reality, and eventually they will be, they will they will be wildly disappointed. Uh, some of them will uh, double down, quadruple down, whatever it takes to uh, ensure that worldview isn't damaged. And that's that's what you've seen the liberal hege- hegemony do in the states. Is uh, anyone who dissents from this um, worldview is excommunicated. And what Elon Musk has done with X has just been a huge breath of fresh air. So the truth is out there. It's destroying uh, mainstream political narratives based in an unreality. And these people are being um, excoriated, held accountable, and hopefully driven out of office soon. So but on that's probably the, the big white pill for me is the ideology and the worldview of these people is collapsing. Because it was never it was never firmly rooted to begin with. These are people who just uh, they went along with the narrative. A lot of these people who go to CPAC, a lot of these people who work in a political um, environment, they are uh, they're careerists and they just latch on to whatever the narrative is, repeat it mindlessly in private. They may take, have dissenting views, but uh, they know that. If they ever said anything publicly, they'd be um, shown the door. So they don't. They just go along. And I think that's one one key benefit of CPAC is demoralizing these people. So going to, going to their events and pointing out during the breaks between presenters that, uh, well, yeah, look, the reality is that guy doesn't actually believe that because he said something completely different two years ago when, when the donors were telling him to say something different. They're not aligned with uh, with the truth in the, in the way that Harry and I tend to be. They're more interested in uh, playing politics, being part of the establishment, getting elected, and they're doing absolutely nothing once they're in office. So it's uh, from that perspective, CPAC is just incredibly sad, and I don't know that it's going to change terribly much, but. Um, it's, uh, it's it's worth attending just so you can meet other like-minded people who are sort of curious about our political establishment and uh, are actually aligned with what's going to come next. Because what's going to come next, I think, is going to be quite radical. And people don't realize Trump is actually a moderate. I mean, this is, um, this is someone that uh, the American Democrats should be grateful for. The, the people to the right of him, I mean, they're, they're the ones who are going to be who are going to be changing the world. Trump is just a, uh, a stepping stone in that direction. I don't think the left has truly cottoned on to what they've unleashed. And I think it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to, the next decade or two are going to be incredible. And we're seeing signs of that early on. So uh, the genie's out of the bottle and it's, uh, it's, going, to, it's going to carve a swath through our conservative political establishment could actually splinter them. And you're going to see some of these dissident right-wing parties doing uh, incredibly well when it comes to uh, establishing uh, beachheads in federal politics and building grassroots conservative movements. Certainly. I liked what you said about the weak foundations upon which conservative conservatism is built at the moment. I mean... In all pre- the, the existence of conservatism and the ideas that they speak about, for example, uh, you can talk about the, their debates about energy policy, which is important, or economic policy, which again is very important. But all of this presupposes a functioning society. You can't have an economy in a country in many of the countries of Africa, not a serious economy, because all you can have is exporting resources, which are valuable to other more advanced societies around the world, and the rest of the time it's civil war and famine. So. All of this presupposes that we have a strong community to begin with and you can't have a community where no one has anything in common and no one shares any history or ancestry. And so they all really do rely upon identitarian presuppositions, only they like to ignore those and act as if everything is built on air and not the bedrock of human nature. So I'll bring you in, Harry. I believe that... The politics that you advocate for and the BAC advocates for is the future for this reason. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Virgil. 
Well, you're speaking to one of my favourite topics, which is institutional economics. And just last week, uh, Darren Akamoglu won the Nobel Prize for Economics for his uh, Colonial Origins paper. So he, he wrote that book, Why Nations Fail. And institutional economics, uh, it describes why rich countries are rich and poor countries are poor. The, base, the basic thesis is fairly straightforward. Rich countries are rich because they have high quality institutions of government. Poor countries are poor because they have poor quality institutions of government. And that's true as far as it goes. But you've got, you've got to go to the next step. Well, where do these fucking institutions come from? And they have this weird theory that um, certain countries were founded by Europeans, therefore they developed uh, inclusive institutions, whereas those countries that weren't settled by Europeans uh, put in place extractive institutions. It's kind of a neat, neat fantasy to get around the fact that, uh, no, the key driver here is the Europeans that actually settled those countries. They built their own institutions and replicated the institutions they had that came with them, which kind of speaks to this uh, identitarian theme you both um, are playing on. Uh, I, th I think there's something to that. It's just I, I, my view is it's... Um, slightly more sophisticated than the fact someone may dance around a maypole or I, I think it's uh it's 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 much deeper than that and it, uh, it's sort of function of values and culture and there's literature there in the uh, academic journals that i've had a look at and these are these aren't uh, controversial uh propositions from a, a purist academic perspective I mean, these, these are only controversial because they're made controversial by our political establishment and its media class. So your your assessment there is spot on. You can't have a functioning first world economy if you don't have uh, first world institutions of government. And immigration, it, uh, it appears to threaten that. So it, it's, a sil it's a silver bullet argument against mass migration is uh, through mass migration, you're changing the politi political character of this country, you're changing the cultural character of this country, and it could destroy the economic institutions of that country to the extent that it compromises your standard of living. And you're seeing the strains of that in America at the moment. No one's having this debate currently, or at least it's, it's not happening in the mainstream. It's certainly not happening at scale in what you might term the dissident right, but is, it is the fundamental argument that um, you can't turn Western civilization into a social experiment and expect this to turn out well. And more importantly, it, uh, it undergirds our economic prosperity, which is, which is fundamental to everything, our quality of life, our ability to defend ourselves, so just uh, what, what, what's been done with America, what's been done with certain parts of Western Europe, it's basically criminal. And these are, there's this function of we just had a weird, really weak political class that got co-opted by ideologues. And I think it's um, once you break their stranglehold intellectually and people realize that everything they said uh, was mistaken or based on a lie, then it all, it's all going to come unraveled pretty quickly in my view. Yep. And that's why I think what the BAC and what Harry talk about regularly is the future in many ways. So I think that um, they're talking about things which are universal throughout human history and eventually will emerge from under the weight of the media's lies. So, Harry, I, I wanted to speak to you and I'll, I'll present some of the questions that the audience gave us this week, um, specifically in regards to what I just mentioned. So, uh, recently, we opened up a system where paying subscribers to the National Observer can submit questions uh, to the guests on the episode each week. And we have another one from Jono here. Now, uh, I'll put the link to Jono's Twitter down in the description if anyone wants to follow him. But he, first of all, said to Harry, uh, he wanted to congratulate you on how well uh, uh, Backpack was run. He says that it was a great networking event, and he, and he says thank you for setting it up. He wanted to also ask that uh, ask regarding the age demographics that he noticed between uh, Backpack and CPAC. He said uh, he, he felt that Backpack was fairly well represented from those in between the ages of 18 and 34, 
um, and that represented people from various nationalist groups. Apparently, there were some members of the Australian Natives Association there as well. <clears throat> and then he says that at CPAC, on the other hand, he noticed that they only had a dozen or so uh, members or attendees within that age range of 18 to 34 out of their 400 plus attendees. Um, would you like to speak on that? Why do you think that young people are disproportionately more interested in identitarianism than uh, this sort of stale conservatism we've spoken about? Um, a couple of reasons. I think young people tend to be less conservative from from my my youth. Like, um, I, mean, I, I was a little bit left of centre. Someone once said, if you if was it Muhammad Ali or someone said, if you're not uh, a socialist when you're 18, you've got no soul. And if you've not got, if you're still a socialist when you're 50, you've got no brain or something. It's like people tend to get more conservative when they're older. Um, also, the um, our media, like when when I was younger, media was until almost entirely controlled by a small, by basically what you might call the swamp or the blob or whatever you want to call it. That was um, you know the Murdoch media. It was it was Kerry Packer and it was Rupert Murdoch and the you know who you know the who was it ran this Sydney Morning Herald that that family okay, Fairfax. Um, and yeah, you know, wherever you went in the world, they, these were small numbers of people who controlled all the information. So people didn't really um, that that we were being. We, we, I think we were subjected to a very sophisticated, um, uh, for one of a better word, brainwashing um, te- techniques to make, to try and wash away this idea of identitarianism and make us feel that it was really it was a bad idea and then something that was completely wrong. Um, younger people have grown up in an era where where information is is much more available now lots and lots of them are off watching tiktok or you know playing game you know, video games or whatever um but there's uh, a, a minority uh, a, i'd call them a smart minority who have picked up on what's going on there was the, i don't know if you you were familiar with gamergate do you ever, ever hear about that where um it was a bunch of young guys who, young white guys who'd been really marginalized from society and just went into their mom's basement and started playing these uh, video games, which were, and, and, and it was the only place where they could like let themselves go. And they were just, were, you know, sexist, homophobic, racist, everything that they could possibly be. And all the good um, stuff, all the good stuff, the things that young men love to do, you know, um, yeah, humor and all those things that we used to have. And healthy pastimes. Healthy, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, a bunch of joyless, I don't know, LGBTQ lesbians or whatever came in and, and discovered this world and were horrified and began doing what the left always do, which is to really pressure these gaming companies to immediately censor all this stuff and make this stuff politically correct and take all the fun out of it, you know. And a lot of these young guys were really radicalized by this because they were smart young people and they began following the money and they, they just, uh, they just kept, kept going. And they, they, cause they were a community. They were like, Hey, you know, let's start digging and trying to figure out what was going on. And I think this is where the alt right really came from. Now, I, I personally, I think that they went far too far. Um, but it was really, um, a start that, I think that was the, the start of the young, the young identitarian thing where a lot of people got um, red pilled there and have carried on. So um, there's a lot. Of, now there's another side to it is that um, people like me grew up in, I went to school. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm a little bit old, but it wasn't that long ago that when I went to school and in my primary school, I don't really like, I'm not saying this. There was one um, half, Pakistani child in my uh, primary school, and that was my adopted brother. Oddly enough, uh, my mum had adopted my brother um, when he was younger. Um, when I went to my secondary school, there was actually no one in that school who was who I was not. <clears throat> well, I, there was one boy in our in our class whose mother was French, and that was about the extent of the diversity in the whole sc- in the whole school. You know, um, there was three Jewish kids in our year. Um, there might have been others in other years. So it, it was, uh, and and so as that increased, you got more a little bit more of these people coming from different countries, and and they there was they were in a small minority, so they they would they fitted in and they just went along with everyone else, and and people said, oh well, you know, one or two of them's okay, so surely you know a few more wouldn't be okay. Um, I think what they don't, what people didn't realize at that time is that um, 
when 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 this was happening, we were a, a super majority. There's one or two kids who might have been Indian or whatever, and might have got a bit of. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Like I said, there was none in our, my school, but I would imagine that kids being kids, it would have given them a bit of bit of a hard time over it sometimes. And I don't think it was anything uh, usually very serious. But when things turned around and you have schools which are, say, sixty percent, you know, there was you, know, you see later on, I see these people, these teachers say, "Oh, it's amazing! Our school has kids from one hundred and sixty different countries." And you think, you know, and maybe let's say there might be a third of them from sub-Saharan Africa or a third of them from the Middle East or whatever. And when these groups get together, they, they start to behave a little, a lot differently than when there's just one or two. They, they start to form gangs and, and, and become identitarian themselves it's because this is what people do. And then the, the, the um, indigenous British children are left um, with a sour taste in their mouth. They, they've had to actually live through this diversity, which we were promised was going to be so wonderful. And they found out that it, it probably wasn't, you know. So I think that there was a lot of kids who, I see it now in, in the, not so much in the girls, but in the boys. Like my daughter's at school now, she's near leaving. But um, I think the boys are a, li a little bit more um, open, especially in the in the younger generations. I think over 25, 26, less so. But I think there's an, an upcoming generation of kids who are, are very open to our message because they've lived through things that have not been much fun. I mean, you had kids, you know, like look, look at Tommy Robinson and he talks about his experiences at school. Uh, you know, he was having, you know, f cousins gang raped by groups of Pakistanis and, you know, the, all, you know, all these things going on. You saw, you've seen the way that he got treated. You've seen videos of Tommy Robinson being beaten by gangs of, you know, uh, uh, Islamic groups and things. Um, so it, it's been a very different experience for those of, of that age group who have come up with the with the experience. And, and I think sometimes, they, I think often they probably blame, you know, you get this bit of a blame of boomers, you know, like, look what you've left us with. I mean, we never voted for it. We didn't really want it, but it was, um, we were probably not um, uh, active enough in trying to prevent it, maybe you could say, but it was just... Um, it was it was foisted on us by these hostile elites who had hold of the the towering heights of the political world. We, you know, the our our, polit our political world was taken over by these kind of people and these ideologues long before people most people realised. I think by the sixties, even the fifties and sixties, these people were just mopping up the opposition. The, the, the opposition was crushed, and they were just they were just mopping up individuals like Enoch Powell. You know, he he was immensely popular in what he, he said he, he had i believe he, he got after his speech uh, the rivers of fire speech he received somewhere around 70 seven zero thousand letters now when has a politician ever received that many letters from constituents ever in the world so um and yet he was fired from his job he was you know he's, i think he gave the speech on a friday night and was fired on the morning monday morning um, because the papers the newspapers went berserk and the, and the, his his uh, prime minister, who you know, was Ted Heath, who was a pathetic uh, individual, just panicked and just fired him. And yet, nothing he'd said was everything he said was um, was actual Conservative Party um, policy. There was nothing in his speech that was not Conservative Party policy. He got fired for making the speech. I mean, that's how weak these older Conservatives were. And I think CPAC is a an extension of that in some way. I don't want to criticise too much the CPAC guys, but just this is, it's a reflection of the, the conservative um, worldview and, and how how weak it, it really is. So. Well said. Um, we'll clip along. So, Birchall, there was a question for you from Jono as well. He said that it's clear that CPAC Australia has an older demographic and that those who wanted to discuss serious issues like migration were ignored. How do we pivot the conversation towards zero immigration with upsetting the Apple cart? I wish Apple or should the Apple Cup be up there because uh, CPAC's not going to avoid it. You can you can you can publish your own opinions and build your own audience. And look at uh, you can publish anything for zero zero dollars basically, and you can build your own audience organically if you're uh, if you uh, try hard enough. It's just. Um, we don't seem to have people who have the willingness or appetite to have done that. I mean, I suppose Jordan Knight's tried to do that with Migration Watch, but it's still pretty, uh, pretty fringe. It's good copy on there, but it's, um, it's got limited distribution. 
And I suppose part of that limited distribution is a function of uh, uh, council culture. So you, you couldn't openly share that if you had a job in corporate Australia or any sort of government organization. Because you'd be um you'd be pounced on by human resources. And this is why one of the key battles domestically is not just freedom of speech, it's also uh the right to privacy, the uh the right to express your opinion politically without it affecting your day job, and human resources departments at the moment are just uh they're completely off the chain. They are wildly unaccountable, they'll fire people for trivia, they'll they'll uh, forestall people's ascension to management because they don't like their views, and these people these people are essentially idiots. I mean, none of these people have any real world qualifications or experience, and yet they're put in these positions and empowered by weak corporate management who just let these people ride run ride roughshod over people's careers. And it's a function of the fact that. Um, the managerial class are just useless. So if you want to work in a, a really productive environment with high conviction people getting stuff done, you don't go you don't go and work for a large corporate because that's just not what they do. You go work for a startup, you go work for a small business, medium sized enterprise, you go work for an owner operator, someone who actually has skin in the game, whereas dealing with these slimy six figure salary girl bosses gay HR managers who will, who will troll your social media to get you fired. It's uh it's it's a dumpster fire. It's not a sound basis for having any sort of sustainable career. So if you're serious about politics, if you're serious about uh, your self respect and dignity, you wanna you wanna get out of those sort of environments and work in sectors where you can be self employed or working for people who just aren't uh, just aren't left wing lunatics. And our government sector and the corporate sector increasingly just becoming this um, dumping ground of left-wing garbage employees and, that aren't terribly productive and just go through the motions and get they 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 hate the own the uh, their own businesses marginally less than they enjoy getting their comfortable six-figure salaries. It's a, it's um it's really quite uh, disgraceful these principal agent issues that economic economists talk about whereby you have a principal say a shareholder or, or a business owner and an agent, their employees, uh, and the employees just do whatever they want because they're, they're not directly accountable. They're not made directly accountable to the, the principles. So I think a lot of this behavior is a function of indifference and indifference on the part of shareholders and the managerial class that those shareholders uh, employ. They're, they're very easy people to bully. They are complete cowards. We see that when it comes to council culture. They're constantly capitulating, constantly apologizing, constantly doing whatever they want them to do because it's e they think it's easier. And it's uh, it's terrible for the employees. It's also terrible for the shareholders. But uh, managerial class, they're not going to be held accountable to either of those people, so they just do whatever the fuck they want. So that's, uh, for me, the, uh, the, the frontier. Right. Of... So in short, you have to be willing to upset the apple cart. Oh, yeah. But uh, look, why would anyone want to be part of this, um, this, this political class? I mean, they exist for the sake of existing. They don't exist for the sake of uh, preserving their country or getting anything productive done. So, uh, yeah, what, what is the point? And look, I, and that's why the audience at CPAC, they're just... Um, they're mostly boomers who who are addicted to the Sky News talking points. Uh, it's they're kind of like they're they're kind of like mindless uh, fans of a boy band. There's not a lot of thought behind uh, their uh, their love for these people. Not a lot of thought for what these people actually do for them. It's just that uh, this is my team. I barrack for them, and I think a lot of these younger guys I met, particularly the um, BAC guys, they're, they're smarter than that. They're really switched on. They're really intelligent. They're almost exclusively male, and they know it's a shit show and a dumpster fire. And I think they don't want any any fucking part of it. And, and yeah, that's a good attitude to have because the whole point of politics is to uh, to change things, not not to be part of the furniture. 
All right, and I'll move on to the next questions from West Renaissance, and these are our final questions, and then we'll wrap up the episode. So uh, just for virtual, this one, is CPAC Australia intent on being an example of American political electioneering in Australia? And if so, why should those themes be tested? Well, I didn't, I didn't see much uh, about electioneering at all. I didn't. Um, so the first CPAC actually included a campaign boot camp, and that was they did it on the morning. I think it was the Sunday morning. And it ran for maybe two or three hours, and I think that was quite well received. Uh, the thing to realize about CPAC or any conservative movement or any think tank is they're only really as good as their weakest donor. And most of the financial supporters of these things tend to be pretty pretty mainstream neoliberal types. So uh, if you if you if you want if you're serious about politics, you to some extent you'll need financial backers. And you just have to find the ones that are extremely based and concerned about the country. And the, the, the sad reality of that is uh, they don't really exist here. The, the, Australia has quite an extremely limited intellectually political class and donor class. These people don't think deeply about politics or economics. So a steady diet of Sky News talking points, that's kind of okay for them. That's just who they are. And that's why I found a lot of these um, people I met at CPAC who were younger, either affiliated with BAC or in that same sort of milieu, they were kind of... Um, their intellectual diet was a lot broader than that, and they were fundamentally in search of the truth, as all young people should be. They weren't in search of some shitty, uh, pathetic career as a political staffer that leads to career suicide at the end of it to achieve precisely nothing. So, um, yeah, look, uh, I forgot the. I think at this point I forgot what the question was. <laughs> Wake, wake me up on that again. Uh, it was mainly about whether it was American, an example of American politics sort of being injected into Australia. Uh, well, no, I didn't see much of that. I just thought, it, I just saw uh, essentially just the coalition's base uh, reheating their old content, and I didn't see a lot of point to that. So I think the first CPAC was a bit more interesting, and they actually had, uh, I think, yeah, they, they did actually have some sort of funding from uh, CPAC in the States, uh, but that caused all sorts of trouble for, uh, I think, the organisers in terms of uh, the foreign the foreign influence regime. So um, I, d I don't think you'll see a return of that, but um, or in, at least in terms of direct support. But all these um, campaign strategies and tactics, I mean, it's, uh, it's not hard to to learn them, I do actually teach them, and part of my trip to CPAC was about finding the uh, next generation of conservative activists that who will do my campaign boot camp and go out there and kick the shit out of the progressives. And we'll talk more about that at the end when we wrap up, but Harry, final question, uh, and this one's a little bit off topic, but uh, it should be interesting. So, Western Renaissance also wanted to ask, uh, where do the British Dominions end and other community interests like Irish expatriates begin? So, I think the answer to that lies, uh, to get the answer, you need to ask our enemies because they will basically tar us with the same brush. And I think you're seeing a lot more um, of people coming together, like going to Ireland, for instance, now you're seeing Catholics marching side by side with, with Protestants saying, this, you know, this, this uh, mass third world immigration is insane. And so, uh, you know, when you have a, an existential threat coming, I think that people start to, to come closer together. Now, um, I think that that's been a natural process anyway. I think, it, obviously, if you go back, I, I'm not an expert on um, Australian history, but uh, 100 years or so, there was, an, I think there was an Irish rebellion. Was it 100 years ago? Is it more than that? Um, I believe the Rum Rebellion is that yeah it? something like that yeah and these people uh, have been shipped out to Australia and they, I think they wanted to go back and fight against the English and they, they were some kind of rebellion and there was there was you know there was various we we actually listed some of this in our book Anglophobia of the uh, the Irish Anglo um, conflict you know uh, conflicts of ideas and things um, I think that that's really softened a lot especially in the last few decades you, you still you know there's still people who are 
I mean, we meet people all the time with red hair and a surname that begins with a letter O and a, an apostrophe or whatever, but they, they're they just Australians like everyone else and they, they fit in. They, they, they've lost a lot of that uh, hostility to, to Britain. And as things are progressing, um, I see um, the, the, those that, that distinction reducing even more. So I, I think that the um, the Irish English thing has, has really softened and will continue to soften, um, partly as as a function of time, and partly as a function of um, uh, you know having bigger fish to fry. If you like, you know, yeah, necessity. Yeah, there's, there's you know a, a, an existential enemy coming in. You know, I don't think if the Chinese were to invade us, I don't think they'd be um, picking out. You know, saying you're you're Irish, you're okay, you get a pass, but you're English. You know, the, to the to the Chinese, it would be oh, you're all just white. You know, right? you know so um, yeah, I, I think that that's uh, something that's, that's slowly disappearing. I mean, it, ha- it has had um, it has in the past been been hostilities and things, but um, yeah, it's, it's reduced, and I think it will reduce further. That's my, my opinion. All right. Well, thank you for that, guys. And uh, we'll wrap it up now. So, virtual first of all, where can people find more of your work? And uh, you can mention your boot camp as well. Oh, look, uh, I've discovered Substack recently and I'm having a lot of fun with it. So, check out my Substack. Uh, but also, feel free to reach out. So, uh, the email is wilson at blackwellstrategies.com and we're forming up to run this campaign boot camp with American instructors toward the end of November. So the only hard part about doing this is uh, herding the cats. So the more people that reach out, the more people that um, sign up to do this thing, the more likely it is to happen, the more likely it is to happen in timely fashion, and the lower the ticket price will be. So um, don't underestimate the importance of uh, networking so net having a network uh, it's just a huge multiply people have skill sets that you don't have so it's not just uh you don't get just trained at this thing you you network with really high quality high conviction individuals and it so it really won't take much to to change things politically it's just uh, a question of this is the model, this is where you go out and execute on that model, and these are the individuals with the moral courage to deal with the press smears or the uh, potential uh, lawsuits even, and this is how you walk through all that. So um, that's uh, something I'm quite mindful of, keeping people safe, but also equipping them uh, with an understanding of electoral law, defamation law, human rights commission type investigations so that um, everyone stays out of trouble. Fantastic. And I'll link all of those uh, links down below. Harry, where can people find more of your work and the BAC? Okay. Um, good place to start is BritishAustralianCommunity.com.au. I think it's the thing. If you if, uh, search Google, um, you'll find the British Australian community fairly easily. Um, Twitter is probably one of the best places. What used to be called Twitter is now called X. Uh, one, we have a big Twitter following. We, we also um, on TikTok. Yeah, uh, we are, we do really well on TikTok. We do um, we're on Rumble and YouTube. We're a good a good YouTube channel. Um, we don't seem to get much traction, oddly enough. Um, <laughs> things that will go viral. We've had a, a video with one point two million hits on TikTok. But if you look on YouTube, <laughs> it was a short, admittedly, but on YouTube they get you know you get we get pretty I think high quality videos and you get like three hundred views, which is um, just tells me that. Um, yeah, YouTube don't like as much, but um, we, all our stuff is on there. So that's the, the videos and things which are good to look up. Um, and yeah, there's contacts on the website. We're we're close to releasing a new updated website. The old website's uh, it's okay, it's functional, but um, it might look a little um, out of date. So we've got a new, more modern, modernized website coming up soon. Um, yeah, um, just you know, contact. Um, yeah, that's, that's uh, probably the, the best best form of contact for us. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you very much, John. Appreciate it. Yeah. Take care. See you, Harry. Bye-bye. Bye. See you, Patrick.